smaller than the entire graph here. So there are 7,000 islands in the Philippines. And in this area, this is known as Region 7, this is the area that I work in. Um, there are about 30,000 fishermen that rely directly on this double barrier down the bank reef. So there are fishermen that go into the reef and fish everything that they can and go back and feed their families and then sell the rest so they can get rice or mangoes or whatever else they need. Um, however, these fishermen rely on this reef. There are destructive fishing methods for decades now that have destroyed the reef to a point that they are not no longer able to get all of the fish that they need for their families and have anything extra. So there are two main types of destructive fishing methods. That's glass fishing, which you see here, and cyanide fishing. These are not my pictures, thankfully, but now, uh, glass fishing, fishermen take dynamite and stick them in bottles when they're on their boat and throw them into the water, which then explodes in the water there and it kills all of the fish that are in the area. And then they can go around in their boat and pick up all of the fish and then sell those later. Um, the second is cyanide fishing, which is mostly for ornamental aquarium fish that are sold here in the United States. Um, cyanide is squirted directly into the reef, which then stuns the fish and you can collect them in your bags and then sell them across the world. So both of these types of destructive fishing methods that are illegal um, destroy the reef and the whole ecosystem that is there by either breaking the coral itself or poisoning the coral and then killing it on its own. So destructive fishing methods and other pressures have destroyed the reef to a point that it can no longer support itself. I'm going to take you to the northern end of a whole island to a community called the Anunito. And this is the community that I work most closely with. I try to come up with grassroots ways for the community and, and the companies that they're working with and the government to develop alternative livelihoods from fishing but, and to get away from the destructive fishing methods that they've come to rely on. Um, a little bit more about the community. There is some seaweed farming in the Denahong Bank and Delta Barrier Reef. On the inner reef, tides are high and low enough that it's perfect. It's just perfect for seaweed farming. Um, the market is a little bit smaller for seaweed farms. I bet none of us have actually had any seaweed, but but they don't have any problems drying all of the seaweed that you see there and then cooking and selling it or eating it themselves. Another thing that they rely on is farming. Um, there's pretty limited technologies for farming, but it's also there. Most of the people in the Philippines, like I've said, rely on fishing. Um, and these are some pictures of uh, traditional fishing methods that are not really good. So what? So we need to work with the communities to help to find other careers and other ways to feed their families. Some of the ways that I come up with in the Nido is what about developing dive tourism in the area? We already have the we have great, fantastic weather. Let's look into that as an option. I talked to community members, uh, I talked to 32 members and surveyed about 100 and, or 1,000 some odd people in Region 7. Um, so I searched social surveys to find out really community support these kind of alternatives. Basically, the answer is yes. In spirit, Filipinos would love to welcome everyone in this room over into their homes and feed them and give them everything that they can. Um, there are only about eight people in the 800 survey here that said, no, they don't think it would be good for their community. But everyone else says, sure, bring it on. Let's see what, what we can do. So my next step was to figure out, all right, what do we need to do in, actually, in order to make this actually happen? What kinds of progress does the community need to see? What kinds of benefits do they think or are expecting to come from this? And what kinds of challenges might we see down the road? So for progress, we're going to move from widening development. There needs to be some kind of funding to get the fishermen to switch their careers into something else. There either needs to be funding to get them into seaweed farming or to give them technologies to move into farming. There also needs to be a lot of education. If we're expecting to change careers, there needs to be skills training or maybe education about new recycling programs or waste management programs that are being put into place. Also, infrastructure. This is a picture of the only hostel that you can stay in as an outsider in the Indiana There are about five people that visit there a year. Um, and infrastructure, the roads that connect the cities are pretty much unfinished and public utilities are very limited from fresh water supply to electricity to internet. <coughs> and finally, a management plan. There needs to be some way to monitor and control the tourism that is being implemented in the area. I went a little bit further and asked, 
ask, all right, if we're going to switch, if we're really going to do this, what kinds of things do you need in order to switch your career, and who do you think you should get it from? Money, knowledge, and equipment were the top three answers, and they're color-coded with the blue being it should maybe come from the government or the red with NGOs. So I presented these results to both the government and the NGOs there, and they were interested to say, oh yeah, mostly money is what we need. Um, if also, if you're going to switch to tourism activities, what, is the, what are the community members most interested in switching to? Not surprisingly, about a third of them said, well, if we can keep fishing, we'd love to keep fishing and sell our fish to tourists. We'll pay more money for our fish than the people that are, than our neighbors. Um, a quarter of them are not interested at all. Another quarter of them said, well, we'll take our fishing boats and take tourists out for recreational guide activities. 15% um, said they would send self handicraft goods, and there are women that do basket weaving there, and they would like to expand that practice. And then this 4% was really interesting to me. They would like to rent a room out to tourists. I'm like, that's great. We need less infrastructure in order to do that kind of thing. So I pushed that a little bit further and said, all right. How many of you are actually willing to welcome people into your homes? Or are you willing to welcome people into your homes? And the majority said no, and that's about 600 people or so. But the 13% there is about 100 Filipinos in the community that said, yeah, sure, we'll rent people, we'll rent our home out. Um, and the NGO government that I was working with were really interested to see what kind of price we're going to be talking about. And that price is US dollars for two people to stay for one week. Moving right along to benefits. What kinds of great things come from tourism? Um, two main things that come, which are between 400 and 500 people that could identify this for you. Alternative livelihoods. There's going to be money to switch from farming or fishing, which isn't really working out for us, into something else. That's what we would like to do. And then government, government revenue, which is tourists are coming in and bringing more money to the government, bringing taxes and money for more fish and things like that to help develop the roads and help develop the infrastructure and all the needs that was need to happen. So the progress and the benefits are definitely connected to each other. But what needs to happen to the tourism is also one of the benefits of tourism. So that fits together nicely. Now we're going to the challenges, which nobody really wants to talk about the challenges of implementing tourism, but it exists and it is real. Um, the challenges are there are less people concerned with these. There's only 250 at the top over there. but there are a lot of them, and they span all of the social concerns and a lot of the environmental concerns as well. In social, you have loss of tradition, changes in technology, increases in drug and sex trafficking, um, crowding as well. Environmental concerns are increases in resource pressure, and increases in pollution, or reef destruction. This gets back to there needs to be some kind of management plan in order to monitor and control these kinds of things in the long term. So that we're not, so that we at least know what's happening and then have the power to control them. So this is the big summary of everything that we're talking about, and they're very interconnected. So what I do is I try to find the best solutions that are unique to a community that they can get behind and support um, to alleviate poverty and to reduce fishing pressure or pressure on um, limited resources. For Viennanito, this might be dive tourism development. But these are complicated issues that we're talking about, and you're talking about a long-term development um, of where staff needs to be dedicated to collaborate and communicate and innovate all the time so that they can monitor and touch base on everything that's happening. So that is what I do, and that's all that I have. Thanks so much.